So welcome everybody to Air Conditioning Bootcamp Session 1. I'm Eric Scheidel, the HVAC Service Mentor, and I want to welcome you all here. Happy to see you all here from all across the country. So let's go ahead and get started on our first lesson. And uh, please follow along in your handouts if you have them printed off. Everything that you see on the screen is going to also be in there. What we're going to talk about today in lesson one is we're going to uh, lay the groundwork. We're going to, to lay the foundation of air conditioning. And we're going to start off with some kind of theoretical things, some principles that you need to understand. And boy, I tell you what, I know how it is when some instructor tells you that he's going to talk about theory. You're like, snooze fast, right? I know, I've been there. Uh, but I'm also going to tell you that some of the material that we're going to cover here today is crucially important, and especially in service and repair. I've been in more situations than I can count when I was helping another technician, either on a service call that he or she was on, or talking about one that, you know, was a bunch of grief and took a lot of time and difficulty to try to get to the bottom of it and still left somebody stumped. And very, very often, the reason why that problem exists, the reason why that trouble exists, is because of something in this lesson that was either underappreciated or misunderstood or just simply not really known. This stuff, I know it's not as fun as using a torch or, you know, uh, using a tubing cutter or using a multimeter, but this is the thing that you really, really need to know and have foremost in your mind. And we're going to come up on these things over and over again. Um, and if we get into more advanced lessons, if you come to some of my more advanced classes, um, we really, really hammer on these things and, and bring it home. So today is going to be an introduction leading, laying the groundwork for that, beginning with what I call BTU basics, some of the fundamentals of heat transfer, including the properties of energy. Properties of energy can never be, um, you can't know them well enough. You are always going to want to uh, continually refresh yourself and remember that. The basics of refrigeration, because air conditioning is a refrigeration process, and uh, we need to know everything there is about that. To go along with that, we have the properties of refrigerants we're going to talk about today. The pressure and temperature relationship, and that has specifically to do with how refrigerants do, the magical things that they do. We are going to do an overview of the refrigeration cycle. And we're going to begin with what is heat? Heat is what it's all about. As heating and air conditioning technicians, we are always concerned about heat, always, every single time. It's all about heat. Heat is a form of energy. And since we are all about heat, we are all about energy, and everything is all about energy. So we need to have at least a working knowledge, a fundamental understanding of what in the heck energy is. And that's not an easy, necessarily an easy thing to really quantify, is it? If somebody walked up to you and said, explain energy to me, you wouldn't really necessarily have a... Uh, exactly great idea of exactly how to explain that or what to say about that. So what we're going to do is we're going to define energy uh, in this way. Energy is a, energy is a uh, force. You want to write this down. Energy is a force that has the ability to can be converted into useful work. Energy is a force that has the ability to perform useful work. One more time, energy is a force that has the ability to perform useful work. And that useful work can be just as simply as hmm, lifting this pen up into the air. To help understand what energy is a little bit more, you need to realize that energy will manifest itself or energy will take the form of uh, nine different things. There are nine major forms of energy that every human being on the planet deals with or recognizes or experiences in some way, shape, or form every single day. So if we can take this kind of weird, um, hard-to-define concept of energy and bring it down into the stuff you deal with every day, it can really start to help put together a picture of what energy is and, more specifically, how energy behaves. 
So here are some very common forms of energy that you are going to be very familiar with. The first one is motion. Energy of motion is also known as kinetic energy. Anything that has to do with anything moving is called kinetic. Now, you and I might also describe this as mechanical. You could call it mechanical energy as well. When we're talking about a machine and it has moving parts, the moving part of it, we call that the mechanics, mechanical energy, or just simply motion. When you move your arm, when you move your hand, that's kinetic energy. When you see the leaves blowing in the wind, that is kinetic energy. Sound is also a form of energy. You're hearing sound right now. You're experiencing the energy of sound. Chemical is another form of energy. And this can be taken, this can take the place in several different ways. Ways in which you're familiar with it, well, you're intimately familiar with it because it's taking place within your own body right now. You take in food, your body digests this food, and the food is then converted into the energy that allows you to move and breathe and live and do all of the things that you do. Plants also experience chemical energy. They have their own food plus energy from the sun, which they transform into the energy source that they use to reproduce and to grow and to form their bodies. These are forms of chemical energy. Another form of chemical energy that you're familiar with is that of an alkaline battery or a lead cell battery. I've got some batteries right here on my desk, these uh, little AA batteries. That's a chemical process going on inside of those batteries. Light is another form of energy. We're very experienced with light, right? We, we, we couldn't do a whole lot of, without it. Heat is a form of energy, and this is the form of energy that we are going to concern ourselves with most specifically, is how energy metaphor manifests in the form of heat. Ironically, though, when we are doing the work that we do with heat energy, we are also going to be experiencing some of these other forms of energy at the same time. We'll to talk about that in just a minute. Gravity is a form of energy. Interestingly enough, gravity is probably the most uh, easy to recognize form of energy, right? What goes up must come down. And if you've ever tripped and fallen down, you know this very, very well. Um, and it's the force that holds everything to the earth. It's also the force that's probably the least well understood of all the different forms of energy, yet it's undeniable. We can observe the effect that it has on everything that we deal with, including the planets and the stars and, and solar systems and everything else. It's a very common yet powerful form of energy. Electricity is one of my favorite forms of energy. And uh, electricity, of course, we deal with on a regular basis. It's naturally occurring in forms of lightning or static electricity, also in our own bodies. Our brains are creating and sending electrical impulses to our muscles, which causes them to move and do the things that they do, it causes our thoughts to happen and uh, causes us to remember and possibly forget things. Nuclear energy, radiation. When I say nuclear energy, I just don't necessarily, don't only mean nuclear power plants, and I don't only mean nuclear bombs, although those are examples of nuclear energy. I also mean the energy that holds atoms together, that holds molecules together, these are examples of nuclear energy. And when the nucleus of an atom is either split or brought together, tremendous amount of energy is released. That's nuclear energy. Radiation that goes along with that can also be kind of clumped under that category as well. Last but not least, magnetism. Magnetism is another form of energy. Magnetism is uh, a little also kind of hard to, hard to really wrap your head around in, in some cases. We've all experienced a magnet. We all know what it is. But it's really kind of pervasive, and it has a lot to do with more than what we think. It's all around us at all times. And our, whole, our Earth actually has, has magnetism associated with it. If you've ever used a dial compass, you've experienced this, the, the magnetism of the poles of the Earth. Really neat stuff. So that being said, why are we going through this right now? The reason is because energy is energy, regardless of what form it takes. 
These are nine different forms of energy, and I'm sure they're not the only forms of energy, but they are the ones that I know that we experience, live with, and deal with on a minute-by-minute -minute daily basis. So you can relate this kind of um, etheric or up, up here kind of concept of energy and bring it right down to earth because you're dealing with it every day. And it's also important to know that each one of these forms of energy can be converted into other forms of energy. Now, there are two on this list that are very difficult to convert energy into. For example, we can't create gravity. We can't cause gravity to occur, at least not as far as I know. And we generally, um, we generally cannot transform, say, sound energy into nuclear energy, but it can go the other way. We can convert gravity into any one of these other forms of energy. We can convert nuclear energy into any one of these other forms of energy. We can certainly create, convert light into heat. We can convert heat into light and sound and vice versa. Now that we realize that all of these things, all of these different examples of energy are really nothing more than different examples of the same thing, you can realize that all of these things will follow a certain set of laws or certain set of rules. They're known as the rules of thermodynamics. And there are people in the world who spend their entire lives dedicated to the study of the laws of thermodynamics and their applications and how to use those laws to create the things that we have, that we live with. The people who created air conditioning systems are very familiar with the laws of thermodynamics. The way air conditioning systems operate is incredibly linked to the laws of thermodynamics. So just as much as if you want to be successful, say, in sports, you need to be incredibly familiar with the laws of motion and the laws of gravity. If you want to be incredibly successful in air conditioning, you also need to be familiar with the exact same laws, only as how they manifest in things like heat, energy, and electricity. And today we're going to focus exclusively on heat. So I just wanted to let you know how all these things kind of combine together. Uh, does anybody have any questions about this concept or this idea before we move forward? Okay, moving forward. Some of the laws, now there are um, several different laws of thermodynamics, excuse me. The one that's most important to us would be considered the first law of thermodynamics. And this is really where we kind of live in the physical world and how we deal with heat energy. Now, you don't necessarily need to know what the first law of thermodynamics is. You don't need to know any of the, uh, you know, difficult mathematical equations that describe it. But you do need to know how it manifests, how it applies in your daily life. So the first one we want to talk about here is the fact that, come on, here we go, heat energy or energy itself, but specifically heat energy, cannot be created or destroyed. When we are working with heating systems, when we are working with cooling systems, we are not generating heat, we are not generating energy. Um, so that is not possible. This is related to the idea that there's a, there's a concept that all of the energy in the universe is pre-existing and that no more or no less has ever existed, nor can ever exist. So instead, we are not going to be creating or destroying energy. Instead, we have the ability to store and release energy. And you notice that little asterisk there, we're going to come to that again, that idea of storing energy. Energy can be converted from one form into another. And that's really what we do. Everything that we do as far as heating and air conditioning professionals goes is we facilitate the conversion of energy from one form into another. That is what the machines we work on do. And when we work on them, we help them do that better or get them from a non-working standpoint to a working standpoint so that they can get back to doing that again. This is important to understand because when we're looking at a system and trying to determine Yes, it's running, but is it running correctly? Is it running as efficiently as it should be? This is how we need to look at that question to get the answer and get that answer correctly in order to serve that customer in the best way. 
And finally, energy can be moved from one place to another. And this is usually a work process. This work process usually requires the use of another form of energy to carry out. And that's what an air conditioning or refrigeration system does. It uses energy in one form to move energy of another form from one place to another place. And that's what we are all about. That's what we are going to be doing. So let's get back to this idea of stored energy. Energy can be stored, heat energy especially, can be stored and released. Stored energy is known as potential energy. That's one way we can describe it, potential energy. Some examples of potential energy are include springs. If you have a spring that's relaxed and then you compress that spring, you put force energy, motion energy into that spring, and you hold it there, now that energy is literally stored in that spring, waiting to be released. If you were to tie that spring in a compressed position and then put it in a box for 100 years and then take it out, the energy that you put into it in the first place will still be in that spring waiting to be released 100 years later. That's stored energy. Compressed gas is another example of stored energy. If you think of an air compressor with, an air, with a compressed air tank that it is pumping into, every individual stroke of the compressor's piston puts just a little bit more air into the tank, compresses the air just a little bit more, squishes it together. That motion energy, that was force, that required power. And every stroke of that piston is added up and stored in that compressed gas cylinder. And it, when you then release that compressed gas, so you want to take and use it to blow some leaves off of your driveway or something like that, or blow some sawdust off of your workbench, that energy is now being released. Interesting to notice, too, that the application of that energy, it may have taken a whole bunch of up and down strokes of the piston in that air compressor to develop the pressure and the power behind that uh, compressed air. Say that compressor runs for an hour to deliver its pressure. We can combine all of that force together and release it in a matter of seconds all at once. This idea of storing energy can really kind of combine um, forces, if you will, literally. My, there we go. Now, um, fossil fuels is another example of um, stored energy. We might refer to that, however, as latent energy. In a fossil fuel, there's energy locked in that fuel, but in order to get it out, we have to transform that substance somehow, right? In the forms of fossil fuels, generally that means we burn them. Same thing with wood. We start it on fire, create that chemical reaction to transform that material into some other material and thereby release its energy, latent energy. We also deal with latent energy in air conditioning. We deal with it a lot. And uh, it's a very significant part of what an air conditioner does is working on latent energy or removing latent energy. And the whole thing is a big old energy transformation and transfer process, which the more you study it, the more I study it, the more fascinating it is, the more interesting it is to me. And uh, if you're anything like me, you're going to be the sale the same way. Now we're going to do something kind of fun. I want you to think about temperature and heat. Temperature and heat aren't the same thing. We kind of want to take uh, the ideas of temperature and our heat in our mind and separate the two. I like to think of it you divorce the two in your mind. No longer are they linked together. Most folks, lay people especially, associate temperature and heat together in the same way, automatically assuming that when something is of a higher temperature, it has more heat. There's more heat there. The quantity of heat in something and the something's temperature are not always directly related. And this is very, very important to recognize that a quantity of heat and the temperature of something don't necessarily have any correlation with one another. This is especially true when we're looking at our air conditioning system. Our air conditioning system is meant to move heat energy out. And when we analyze the performance of an air conditioning system, we want to look and see how well, how good of a job is it doing at moving heat out. And if the only thing we look at is temperature, we will be fooled into thinking it might be doing a better job than it is, or we might be fooled the other way into thinking it's not doing as good of a job as it is. 
but neither of those things might be true. You have to understand that temperature and heat are not necessarily the same thing. We'll talk more about that as we get on and we start talking about heat energy a little bit more. So we're just going to introduce that for right now. Here's a way that we can kind of illustrate that. We measure temperature in degrees Fahrenheit in the United States. Other parts of the world measure temperature off of a different scale. If you're not measuring in Fahrenheit, you're probably measuring in Celsius, also known as centigrade. Celsius and centigrade are just two names of the exact same thing. For example, at zero degrees centigrade, or Celsius, which seems super cold, that's 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Our temperature scales are really based on how we feel about things, the human feeling. And it's also based on things that we know. And the Fahrenheit scale and the Celsius scale are both, both based on the temperature at which water will boil and the temperature at which water will freeze into ice. In the Fahrenheit scale, the temperature at which water boils is 212 degrees Fahrenheit right up here. Mark that down, because it's not on this slide. Mark that down on this slide that the temperature at which water boils is 212 degrees Fahrenheit, also known as 100 degrees centigrade. It's the same temperature, but it sounds a whole lot different, doesn't it? Those of you out in Texas, if I told you it's 100 degrees outside, you'd be like, yeah, tell me about it again, right? Um, but however, if it was 100 degrees Celsius outside, we'd probably be all dead. Just different ways of describing something. It's just a, it's a mindset of what we think is really hot and what is uh, what is um, actually a lot of heat energy. Now, I need to pause for a sec because there is a question. Thank you for the question. The question is back to latent heat again. Here we are. The question is, so latent heat is potential energy that changes types of energy. Sometimes it is. In the example of fossil fuels, that is, that is correct. We're going to transform a fossil fuel, which really doesn't have a whole lot of use all on its own, until it undergoes a transformation process. And then it becomes forms of heat energy, light energy, and sound energy oftentimes. Because you can, of course, have the heat energy from a flame. You can see the flame because it gives off light. And you can often hear the sound of the flame. Those are the three forms of energy being released when there is a fire, when there is combustion. When we're talking about latent energy in air conditioning, and we're going to get to this a little more deeply, a substance has to transform in a way where uh, the heat energy that's trapped inside of it can be released. And uh, bear with me, we'll talk more about that when we get there, but it's not quite the same as a combustion process of transforming energy from one type of energy into another. Really what it is is taking heat energy that's stored in something, causing that something to change form and getting that heat energy out. So it's heat to heat, only it's invisible heat into recognizable heat. We'll get there in just a couple of minutes. Let me know if that uh, answered your question. Back to the different temperature scales. So if you were to uh, think about a temperature that you consider to be very, very cold, everyone can agree that 10 below zero Fahrenheit is very, very cold. Yes, it's way below freezing. In fact, it's 42 degrees below freezing. Uh, there's another temperature scale called the Kelvin scale. Kelvin is related to centigrade. Uh, if we're talking about its relationship to Fahrenheit, we call it Rankine. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but it's R-A-N-K-I-N-E. If you look at a temperature that's very cold, like minus 10, according to the Kelvin scale, we take our minus 10 over here and, and bring it right across, you can see that that's equal to about 250 degrees Kelvin. That's pretty high temperature if we're thinking in Fahrenheit think, right? Super high if we're thinking in Celsius think. The Kelvin scale begins with its zero point at a theoretically theoretical point of no energy, no heat available whatsoever. This is known as absolute zero, and uh, there's absolutely no heat energy there at all. So the Kelvin scale is a much more accurate depiction of total heat energy. More accurate, I didn't say entirely accurate, but more accurate. So when you can see minus 10, boy, there's no heat there. Actually, yeah, there is. Compared to there being no heat at all, 250 is quite a bit of heat energy. This is why I want to talk to you about how the idea that there is no, 
temperature and heat energy aren't exactly the same thing. But now you can see a relationship here, though, can't you? That as the temperature of a substance decreases, it's a, a total amount of heat energy also decreases. But there is still heat energy there. And there's, a, there's more to it than just the temperature. We're going to get to that more to it in a couple more slides. This brings us to what is air conditioning. The definition of air conditioning is to control the temperature and humidity of an indoor occupied space, period. Another definition is to control the temperature, humidity, velocity, and cleanliness, and the volume, if I didn't say that, of the air delivered to that indoor space. So it depends on how we're thinking it. Are we thinking about the air stream and its conditions? In that case, we're talking temperature, humidity, velocity, and cleanliness. If we're talking about the conditions of the occupied space itself, we're talking about temperature and humidity. Humidity is another way energy is manifested in water vapor in the air. We'll talk about how that happens in just a little bit. In order to control temperature and humidity, we need to move energy out of the air. And that's what our air conditioning systems do. We're going to do that by a process of refrigeration. The definition of refrigeration is to move heat from where it is not wanted to a place where it will not be objectionable, which is where we just don't care whether it's there or not. Notice I didn't say move heat from inside to outside because that's not always what happens. That's usually what happens, but not always. Sometimes it could be moving heat from inside into a bucket of water and then moving the bucket of water somewhere else or pouring it down the drain. Or in the case of a water-cooled system, maybe it's moving heat from inside and then depositing it into the earth, as in a earth-linked geothermal type of, uh, or geo-exchange, as they're called, uh, refrigeration system. Or maybe it is taking heat from inside the plant manager's office and dumping it out into the plant, both of which are indoors locations. So it's more of a broad definition, but this is all about moving heat. To go along with this concept is the idea that there is no such thing as cold. When you're working in air conditioning, and especially in refrigeration, or especially if you're working in heat pump systems, the idea of cold really doesn't exist. The notion of cold does not apply. So instead of adding cold, what we do is we remove heat. You cannot add cold to something. You cannot make something colder. All you can do is take heat away from it and move that heat energy out of the thing that it's in and put it into something else. That's what we do. We take heat energy out of something and put it into something else. And that's something that we specifically are concerned with, if we go back a couple of slides, is indoor occupied space. So if we put all these definitions together, we are going to remove heat energy from an indoor occupied space and deposit it someplace that we are unconcerned with, usually outside. Now that we have this going on in our minds, we can realize that areas that have a lower temperature are not necessarily colder, but they have a lower BTU content. Now, it's very difficult to walk around talking about, well, this has a greater BTU content and this has a lower BTU content uh, in general terminology. So we're still going to use terms like warmer and cooler to describe temperature. Just be aware that we're not necessarily describing heat energy when we do that. Sometimes we are, but usually we're not. Remember, finally, that energy cannot be created. It cannot be destroyed. It can be transformed from one form into another, and it can be moved from one place to another, and it can be stored in something. Now, one, of the, one of the tricks that we refrigeration people use is we'll take the energy and we'll cause it to become attracted to something else, cause it to be trapped there, and then take that something else and move it somewhere else and get rid of it over there. It's kind of like trapping a squirrel in your attic or something, right? You put a little bait in the trap, Squirrel goes in, 
follows the bait, trap closes, you can pick the trap up, take the squirrel outside where you don't care about where he is, and get rid of him. That's kind of what we do with refrigeration. We move heat from one place into another. We can't necessarily cause the squirrel to not exist. <laughs> Even if we were to poison it or shoot it, it would still be there. We'd still have to physically remove it. And that's what we're doing with our heat energy is physically remove it. You cannot destroy it. Now, a way to kind of further wrap your head around the idea of refrigeration and the idea of causing heat energy to move into a substance or be absorbed by a substance and be trapped there, I want you to think about ice. Ice refrigeration was the very first kind of refrigeration. And if any of you know me at all, and you've been to any of my classes, you know that I love to think about where does everything come from? What did, how did this get to be the way it is now? It's really helpful to understand what things are because everything now is based off of something that came before. Our modern day refrigeration systems did not just drop out of the sky. They were based on ideas of something that had been done previously. And that previously thing is ice refrigeration. If you've ever put a, a, a bunch of ice from the, from the grocery store into a cooler and filled it full of uh, snacks and beverages and taken it on a fishing trip or a boating trip or a camping trip, you've done ice refrigeration too. But you might not have necessarily realized what's going on. When we talk about refrigeration, we talk about tons of refrigeration. We talk about a two-ton air conditioner, a five-ton air conditioner, a 20-ton air conditioner. When I first got started in, in heating and air conditioning, uh, was, I, I did not know, literally, I didn't know the difference between a, a furnace and a water heater. Um, I could probably figure out the thing with the water pipes on it. It must have something to do with water. But other than that, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't really know. You know, if you told me to go down and change the air filter, I'd come back upstairs an hour later and ask you what, what you want again. So I, I didn't know anything. But I got started, and I started learning these terms, right? And I came uh, – I was talking to my dad one day, and I said, hey, Dad, I was I was servicing a two-ton air conditioner the day and blah, blah, blah. And he says, whoa, two tons, that must be a really big one because he's thinking two tons is really heavy. A ton of weight is 2,000 pounds, and that'd be 4,000 pounds. That's a really big something, right? That's got to be the size of a bus at least. Well, no. Refrigeration capacity is measured in tons, but this term comes from the days of ice refrigeration. And what it means is it refers to the amount of heat energy that's absorbed by ice as it melts. In order to transform ice from solid ice into liquid water, it must absorb heat energy. In order to transform ice from liquid water, you have to apply heat energy to it. Anytime ice is melting, it's absorbing heat energy. And this term of one ton of refrigeration refers to the specific quantity of heat required to cause one ton of ice that is at 32 degrees Fahrenheit to completely transform into one ton of water at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. 32 degrees Fahrenheit is the temperature at which water will either freeze or melt, depending on whether heat is being removed from it or heat is being added to it. And in this case, when we're talking about melting, heat is being added to it. And this is latent heat absorption. Heat is being added to this substance, and as the ice melts, the heat is trapped in that melted water and stuck there. Notice the temperature of the ice had not changed. It, melt, it was started off as solid at 32, ended up as liquid at 32. Temperature and heat energy aren't the same thing. The amount of heat energy required to melt one ton of ice into those conditions is 12,000 BTU. And we'll talk about BTU in just a minute. These days when we're talking about refrigeration capacity, whether it be a walk-in cooler or whether it be a heat pump or whether it be an air conditioning system, one ton of refrigeration is equal to 12,000 BTU per hour of heat transfer or moving 12,000 BTU in one hour's time. So when I was talking about a two-ton air conditioner, I was talking about an air conditioning system that had the ability to move 24,000 BTU of heat energy for every hour that it operated. Now, if it operated for one solid hour, it would have absorbed or removed 24,000 BTU of heat. 
You might want to write this down in the blank space under here, just as a reference, because uh, it's hard to remember sometimes on the, uh, the drop of a hat. Two ton, or um, one ton equals 12,000 BTU slash H, BTU per hour. One and a half ton equals 18,000 BTU per hour. Two ton equals 24,000 BTU per hour. Two and a half ton equals 30,000 BTU per hour. Three ton equals 36,000 BTU per hour. Three and a half ton equals 42,000 BTU per hour. Four ton equals 48,000 BTU per hour. There is no such thing as four and a half ton. Nobody makes one. Jumps from four ton to five ton. Five ton is 60,000 BTU per hour. In commercial applications, they don't necessarily say, uh, you know, in the model numbers, things like three ton, two ton, five ton, whatever, they'll have a number that indicates thousands of BTU per hour. For example, if I go to a commercial unit and it's a model number ABCDXYZ-75-240- something, 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 that 240 means 240,000 BTU per hour. That would be a 20 ton air conditioner. So that's the way the whole ton thing works. Um, but it's based on ice refrigeration. And if we take a look at ice refrigeration, we can understand what modern-day refrigeration does because modern-day refrigeration seeks to duplicate the exact same process. The old-fashioned ice box, and this is an old-fashioned ice box. I was thrilled one day. I went to a local um, antique store, antique market, actually, and was walking around, and I actually saw one of these in absolutely perfect condition. I was just I was just amazed. It was awesome. So if you're ever in an antique store, keep your eyes out for the ice box. If your grandparents ever ask you to go to the ice box and get yourself a popsicle, this is why they say that, because it used to be an actual ice box, a box with ice in it. There would be a tray in the top to put a big old block of ice, and people in the northern parts of the country would go out onto the frozen lakes in the winter and saw giant blocks of ice out of the frozen surface of the lake, taken by horse and sleigh and um, put them in a uh, insulated storehouse called the Ice House. If you ever heard of Ice House beer? That's where it got its name from, an actual ice house. And uh, Ice House had a real thick wall. They packed the ice in sawdust, make sure it was kept cool for use in the summertime, and then the ice man would deliver, um, would deliver um, ice around to the homes. Um, so the ice was used to preserve fresh food, and uh, it was our early refrigeration system. The beauty of the ice box over the cooler is that you don't have to have your food in an ice bath. The ice and, and the food are kept separate from one another. So a person could just open the door, reach in and grab uh, a pear or a tomato or whatever, and, or uh, um, eggs and milk, and, and take it out without having to get all wet. So heat energy, or BTU, would be moved out of the food and into the ice. As the ice absorbs this heat energy, the ice, of course, will melt. And the melted water contains that BTU heat energy inside of it. It's not high temperature. It's not a lot of temperature, but it's heat energy. That heat energy would be trapped into the water. It would run out through a drain, either right outside or into a catch pan underneath. And then some person would have to come along and take the catch pan out and throw it outside to melt uh, water the tomatoes or the grass or the flowers or whatever. And in this way, heat energy was literally moved from the food into a secondary substance, ice slash water, and that substance was physically transported to another location, and all of the BTU that had been absorbed by it was also transported at the same time, and that water was then dumped outside. This is how heat energy moves from a substance into another substance and then out of the system. And that other substance, in this case ice, is known as a refrigerant. We use refrigerants in air conditioning 
and they're one of the properties they have is that they won't freeze solid like ice will, and that makes allows it us to use them more easily and with less regular maintenance. We don't have to replace the ice all the time. We don't have to dump the water out. And we've got a question here, so thank you. The question is back to the tons. When you have five tons at 60,000 BTU, that's a big air conditioner, right? That's as big as they come residentially. When it comes to heating, Heating BTUs are way higher. For example, a 60,000 BTU furnace is a not so big one. They get, they get up to twice that size and sometimes a little bigger. I've seen a, a couple handful out there up as high as 150,000 BTU of, of heat output. When it comes to heating, the BTUs are way higher. Is there any reason for that? Yes, there is. The amount of heat energy that needs to be moved out of a space say in the summertime, or the amount of heat energy that needs to be moved into a space, say in the wintertime, is dependent upon two things. The first thing is the size of the space, and the second thing is the temperature difference between the inside and the outside. So if we have a preferred indoor temperature in the summertime of, say, 70 degrees, and we have a high outside temperature of, say, 100 degrees, that's a temperature difference of 30 degrees. Okay, so there is one requirement for moving heat energy out of the system based on that temperature difference between inside and outside of 30 degrees. In the wintertime, however, especially in northern climates, in cold weather climates, if we have an indoor temperature set point of, say, 70 degrees once again, and a uh, extreme cold temperature expected of, say, minus 10 outdoors, now, uh, well, let's say we're up in northern Minnesota, uh, which might even be minus 20 up there. But say it's minus 10. The difference between 70 and minus 10 is 80 degrees difference. That's a whole lot bigger temperature difference that needs to be made up. That's going to be result in greater amount of BTU per hour needing to be added back into that house. So there's a 32 degree temperature difference in the summer versus a 80 degree temperature difference in the winter in the same physical structure. So the heat requirements in winter are generally larger. The BTU requirements are generally larger than they are in the summertime. Now, if you're in a specific location, say um, somewhere in the middle of the country, say you're in Oklahoma, you have a summertime temperature of um, 100 degrees. You can have a very, very cold winter. Now you're going to have to have a gas-fired furnace of high capacity and a uh, air conditioner of a pretty decent capacity as well for air conditioning. The further south you go, the less need there is for winter night time cooling. So your um, air conditioner is going to be the dominating factor, and your actual heat load in the wintertime may be similar or less than your cooling load, depending on what your weather conditions are and what those temperature differences are. So that's the basic idea. And when we get to the next couple of sections, it's going to become a little bit more clear on how that works. So thank you for that question. Um, any other questions from anybody else at this point? So we just got done mentioning heat energy, and we used the term BTU. BTU is an acronym. It stands for the words British Thermal Unit. Here in the United States, we still use what is known as the English or Imperial form of measurement. So our measurements of distance are things like miles, yards, our measurements of length are things like inches and feet, of course, which also translates into yards and miles. Our measurements of weights are in ounces and pounds. Our measurement of um, heat energy is in BTU, British Thermal Units. Our measurement of temperature is in Fahrenheit. So these are all units of measurement in the imperial measurement scale. So BTU really doesn't mean anything to anybody, right? It's like, when have you ever held a handful of BTU? When have you ever looked at these BTUs and been able to count them? You can't do that. When have you ever been able to put a bag full of BTU on the scale and weigh it? Or lay it out on the table and, and measure it with a, with a ruler? You can't do that. In fact, BTU in heat energy is kind of tricky. It's very difficult to actually observe heat energy directly. It's a lot easier to observe temperature. Um, 
So instead of being able to observe BTU, we have to observe the effect that BTU has on something else. It's kind of like the wind. If you've ever been to North Dakota uh, or uh, some parts of Kansas in certain times of the year, you can look out over the farm fields and see all the way to the horizon and not see another thing sticking up out of the earth. There's no trees, no bushes, the fields are plowed, there's no plants, there's nothing to see. And if you're looking out your window on that landscape, it would be very difficult to determine whether or not the wind is blowing. You can't really observe the wind until you observe the effect that it has on something else. So if you put a flag in the yard, or you have a windsock in the yard, or there's a bush or a tree in the yard, now you can see the wind pushing on that thing, moving that thing. Heat energy is kind of similar. We can't observe it directly. We can't observe the effect that it has on something else. And the standard of measurement for heat energy, BTU, that something else is water. And that makes a lot of sense. Because in early science, in mankind's history, there were four elements. It was earth, air, fire, and water. And I'm a big sci-fi buff, so I know that there was a fifth element that Bruce Willis discovered. That's a whole other story, though. The water was well known to people, and we first experienced water and the unique properties of water, and early scientists first started to study water and the effect that heat energy has on water. And as it turns out, water is an excellent study for this because it's so stable. The definition of a BTU is the amount of heat energy that is required to raise one pound of water we're talking about weight here, not volume. Notice I didn't say gallon. One pound of water, one degree Fahrenheit at sea level. So the, the pressure at which this is under has something to do with it. That's why the sea level is there. So you change altitude, it will change boiling point. And if you've ever been to the mountain states, the Rocky Mountain West, uh, you may have experienced this if you've ever tried to boil pasta or uh, something like that. Water boils at lower temperatures in higher altitudes. But the quantity of heat required to raise one pound of pure water, one degree Fahrenheit at sea level. Where pure is important also, because if we add different minerals to the water, that is also going to change the effect that heat energy has on water. So the idea, though, is that we're not measuring heat energy directly. We're observing the effect that it has on something else, and that something else is water. When we're interested in moving heat energy along, since we're not interested in destroying it or creating it, we're interested in moving it. And there are laws that govern the movement or the transfer of heat energy. I can transfer heat energy from one substance into another substance. And in order to do that, I have to realize that heat energy will move from a warmer body to a cooler body. Heat moves from warm to cold. The second rule is that the greater the difference in temperature between those two bodies or those two locations, the faster the rate of heat transfer will be. Unless I didn't say the larger the total quantity of heat transfer will be, the faster the rate will be. So rate, there's a time aspect involved as well, which is why we always measure heat transfer in a quantity of heat over a period of time. And that's always expressed as BTUs per hour. It's kind of like the difference between miles per hour and miles of distance traveled, right? You can say, I'm going 90 miles per hour. Well, you must have traveled an awfully long ways. Well, not necessarily. I may have gone 90 miles an hour for a block and a half before I hit the brakes. Uh, or I may have gone 35 miles per hour for 300 miles. So just like speed and distance, BTUs per hour and total BTUs removed aren't always the same thing. In this example, I've got two bricks. One brick is at 70 degrees and the other brick is at 50 degrees. If I take the 70 degree brick and set it on top of the 50 degree brick, heat energy will move from the 70 degree brick into the 50 degree brick. The speed at which those units of heat energy move, those BTU, and I like to think of BTU almost like 
heat pellets. I like to think of heat pellets, like, like little, little particles of heat that are physically moving around. I have to think of that because I can't see them. Those little BTUs are going to move from the 70 degree brick and become absorbed by the 50 degree brick. And as that happens, that is going to happen at a certain speed. The speed at which those heat uh, elements or those heating heat units will travel is governed by the difference in temperature between the two things. If I have another brick that is 90 degrees and another one that's 20 degrees, and I set those two bricks on top of one another, heat energy will again move from the warmer brick into the cooler brick. But in this example, it's going to move a lot faster than it is in the previous example. In the previous example, on the 70 and the 50, as the heat energy moves from the 70 degree brick into the 50 degree brick, the temperature of the 70 degree brick will begin to fall and the temperature of the 50 degree brick will begin to increase. The heat exchange will cease, or it will stop altogether when both bricks arrive at the same temperature. And theoretically, in this example, when I have two bricks that are exactly the same as one another, same size, shape, weight, and material, and there's no other outside influence going on, that midway point should be about 60 degrees, which is exactly halfway between 70 and 50. In the example on the right, with the 90 degree and the 20 degree bricks, the initial heat exchange rate or heat movement rate will be much faster. But still, the temperature of the 90 degree brick will begin to fall, and the temperature of the 20 degree brick will begin to rise. As those two temperatures become closer together, you can see that eventually they're going to be in the exact same condition as the first example. The rate of heat exchange will slow down. As the two temperatures get closer and closer together, the speed at which the heat moves will slow down, and we can observe this by observing the temperatures of those two different bricks to observe that speed. As they get closer, the speed slows down. The initial movement from, say, here to here to here to here probably happens pretty quick. From here to here to here to here is a little slower. And right about there, boy, it's barely moving, but it's moving. And it goes real slow. If you've ever used your thermometer, and if you've noticed that your thermometer, your thermometer is also going to be absorbing heat, right? If you take your thermometer out of your pocket and you stick it into a cold air duct, for example, it is going to start having heat removed from it by the cool air. And so it's very going to quickly going to fall in temperature. But as the temperature gets closer and closer to the temperature of the actual airstream, you'll notice your thermometer starts to slow down. And that is because of this reason. This is also the reason why in the wintertime you have a faster rate of heat transfer than you do in the summertime because there is that temperature difference to take into account. And that's what it's all about. So that leads back to the question earlier that we had from the individual about why is my furnace so much larger in BTU capacity than my air conditioning system? That's the reason why, because our furnaces and our air conditioners are removing or adding BTU per hour, and our temperature difference in our structure is what determines the heat loss or the heat gain from that structure in BTU per hour. So it's heat energy over a period of time. When we're talking about air conditioning, we just, we we talk we say that we have two types of heat. There really aren't two types of heat. There's just heat. There's just heat energy. But as we experience it, since we experience heat energy through the medium of temperature, we can say that we have two types of heat. Actually, we have two types of heat transfer. So I want you to add that word here. I think that's better. Let's say two types of heat transfer. Okay? The first is sensible heat or sensible heat transfer. Sensible heat is heat energy measured in BTU that when added or removed, it will register a change on a thermometer, or it can be felt or sensed by the human senses. Hence, that's why it's named sensible heat. It can be sensed by our senses. So if I can, I can recognize temperature rise or I can recognize a temperature drop. I can recognize that when it happens, when temperature is rising, heat energy is being added to that substance. 
when the temperature is falling, heat energy is leaving that substance, or heat energy is being removed from that substance. When we think about freezing and we say we're going to, uh, you know, we're going to make something cold, like we're going to put it outside, we're going to put this thing outside and make it cold, we kind of think of the outside as adding cold to it. What we can't see is that the heat in it is being absorbed by everything outside. It's just that everything outside is so much bigger than that thing that we really don't notice a noticeable temperature difference with the outside stuff. We only notice the temperature difference on the little thing that we put out the back door to get cold. If you leave your boots outside in the wintertime and then you go to put them on, you'll think, man, yeah, the outside made your boot cold. In fact, the outside took the heat away from your boot and just <laughs> distributed amongst the masses. Latent heat, on the other hand, is heat energy or BTUs that when it is added or removed from a substance, it will not register a change on the thermometer. And this goes back to the earlier question about what is latent heat. In this case, the substance has to transform. Just like the ice transformed from solid into liquid, or if that water then were to transform from liquid into steam, that is going to require latent heat addition, the addition of latent heat. While water is boiling, transforming from water into steam, heat energy is being added to that water. However, while water is boiling, it's not going to change in temperature. You may have never thought about this before, but you might ask yourself the question, if water boils at 212 degrees, can you do anything to make water boil hotter than 212 degrees? And the answer is, well, no, you can't. Not without changing its pressure, but that's something else. Can we add more heat to it and make the fire bigger to make it boil hotter? No, you can't. The only thing you're going to do is make it boil faster. You're going to increase the re if heat transfer, but you're not going to change the temperature whatsoever. In fact, you can boil water in a paper cup. You can boil water in a plastic canister. Um, and it doesn't matter how much heat energy is there. It's being absorbed by the water as it's boiling. This is known as latent heat. And it's always absorbed during a change of state. When we're talking about liquids, a change of state means to transform from a liquid into a vapor or from a liquid into a solid or back again the other way. From a vapor into a liquid, that's condensation, right? That is heat transfer. From uh, ice into liquid, that is latent heat transfer. From liquid into ice, that's latent heat transfer the other direction. So even though it's the same heat energy, it doesn't register a change on the thermometer. We can call it hidden heat or invisible heat. And that's what we mean by the latent heat. And we deal with it a lot in our air conditioning systems. We deal with it in two ways. One way is with the removal of humidity. Moisture in the air is in vapor form. And in order to remove it from the air, that vapor has to be transformed into liquid. That means that the heat energy that's trapped in that vapor has to come out to allow that liquid to turn into vapor. I'm sorry, to allow that vapor to turn into liquid. In the summertime, when you pull a cold beverage out of the fridge, and you want it to stay cold longer, you put it in an insulating cup, right? Or you put it in a can koozie. The biggest advantage that that can koozie has is to prevent the air from touching the can. Therefore, the moisture in the air does not condense on the can. It's not so much the temperature of the air as it is that moisture condensing on the can. All of that heat energy will then be absorbed by your cold beverage, and it won't be cold for very long because heat energy moves from a warmer area to a cooler area. It's not so much the temperature difference that's causing your can to warm up as it is the energy in the water that's being absorbed as that condensation occurs. And in our air conditioners, we deal with that a lot. We're also going to learn in a few, in a little bit, that our uh, refrigeration systems are constantly transforming refrigerant from a liquid into a vapor and from a vapor back into a liquid again. And that is also latent heat absorption and latent heat rejection. And that's the fundamental principle around which air conditioning systems are based. Do we have any questions about that at this time? Uh, we did have a question about uh, latent heat. 
And uh, just to reiterate that latent heat is heat movement or heat transfer that takes place during a change of state of a substance. And that's, that can happen in many cases. And one of the most easily observed cases is the case of boiling water. And I'm going to give you an experiment to do uh, for homework at the end of today's lesson. But while, if you can imagine boiling water on the stove, you're adding heat to the boiling water, and the, the heat is being absorbed by the water, and the water is transforming from um, liquid into vapor. If you wanted to get that heat energy back out of that vapor, once it transformed into vapor, you would have to cause that liquid to, or that vapor to condense back into liquid again. While this is taking place, there is no temperature change on the, on the scale, if you're measuring it with a thermometer. And the refrigerant inside of our refrigeration systems does exactly this. It transforms from a liquid into a vapor. And while it does that, inside the refrigeration systems, it's absorbing heat energy. Then we take that refrigerant in vapor form that has that heat energy trapped inside of it and transport it to an outdoor location or some other location and cause it to recondense back into a liquid again. And during that recondensation process is when that heat energy that was previously absorbed is now rejected in another location. Does that answer your question? Okay, welcome back from break. To review what we've talked about so far um, regarding heat energy and heat transfer that I really want to stick with you is that in air conditioning and refrigeration we work in moving heat from one place into another place. Heat energy moves from a warmer area to a colder area and we do a process of refrigeration using a refrigerant that is in the process of changing states to facilitate that movement of heat. Now, when heat is being transferred, when heat is moving, there are three different kinds of heat transfer, three different ways in which heat transfer takes place. And they are known as convection, conduction, and radiation. Radiation doesn't just mean uh, you know, thermal nuclear warfare, radiation poisoning kind of thing. It means a means by which energy is transferred, specifically heat energy. Let's go through them one at a time. Convection is the transfer of heat using a liquid or a gas. For example, if um, you go into a sauna or a hot tub, excuse me, like a jacuzzi, it's a nice warm, 110, 120 degrees, and you soak in that, and you're like, oh, that is so warm. That is an example of convection. Heat is being transferred from water into your body. On the other hand, if you jump in the shower and someone uh, runs some hot water somewhere in, in, in another faucet and you get a blast of cold, like, oh, my God, I'm freezing, it's also an example of convection, that the heat is now moving from you into the water it's touching you. Water isn't making you cold. The water, you are giving heat to the water. In the frame, in, in form of a gas, this is your forced air heating system, right? Warm air comes out of the vents and the heat energy then moves from it into the relatively cooler surroundings. Conduction is the transfer of heat through a solid material, any solid material. All solid materials conduct heat. All solid materials have some uh, aspects of conductivity. The opposite of conductivity, of course, is insulation or an insulator. Insulation does not stop the flow of heat. It merely slows it down. It reduces the rate at which heat moves. But all solid substances, almost all solid substances, and there might be some super high-tech gizmachi out there that doesn't, but almost all solid substances will conduct heat. For example, if you have a iron and you are ironing a shirt with your iron, heat is moving from the hot surface of the iron into the relatively cooler surface of your shirt. That's an example of conduction. If, uh, if you've ever heard the term heat rises, you are partially correct. Heat does rise, but heat also moves in all directions universally. Heat is not confined by gravity. Heat does not just rise. Heat moves equally in all directions. To say that heat rises is actually untrue. 
less dense things will float upon heavier things. And air of a warmer temperature is lighter weight than air of a lower temperature. Therefore, it floats upward. Warm water does the same thing. You'll find warm water on the surface of the lake, cold water on the bottom of the lake. That is temperature stratification. It's not because heat rises. It's because the warm water is more buoyant or lighter than the cold water is. Heat will move equally in all directions. And if you don't believe that, Take a piece of metal or steel or copper tubing in your hand and hold it like this so that it's pointing upward and apply a flame to the end of the pipe. If heat rises, you'll be just fine. But no, you know darn well that it's, especially if it's a copper or aluminum pipe, that heat is going to go down into your hand quicker than you can say boo. Heat moves equally in all directions. It's very important to remember when we're talking about air conditioning and heating systems is that heat, heat movement is omnidirectional. It has no preference for up, down, or sideways. And when you study heat loss and heat gain calculations, we, you can realize that heat loss and gain through a uh, ceiling and a roof is not really all that much dramatically different than it is through a wall panel or even through a floor. Um, doesn't have a whole lot to do with it. Radiation is the third type of heat transfer, and this is the type of heat transfer without using a gas, a fluid, or a solid. In conventional air conditioning systems, radiation heat transfer does not take place. That's something you're going to want to write down. In conventional air conditioning systems, radiant heat transfer or radiation does not take place. We do have radiation taking place in a gas fire heating system. We do have radiation taking place in a electric heating system. We do not have it taking place inside of an air conditioning system. It pays to know what radiation is, however. Radiation is a line of sight heat transfer from a warmer object to a cooler object. If you've ever been in front of a fireplace or a campfire, you've experienced radiant heat. Or if you've ever been outside on a sunny day, you've experienced radi radiant heat. It's most noticeable if you go outside on a cold, winter, sunny day. If you go outside in the sunshine, you feel the warm sun striking your skin. It feels nice and warm. And then if you step behind a building and get in the shade, suddenly you're like, whoa, it's cold back here. It's not any colder. It's just that you're no longer being warmed by the rays of the sun, which is radiant heat transfer. Uh, or if you're in a fireplace, all right, and somebody stands in front of you, you're no longer receiving the benefit of that heat. One thing that's important to remember about radiant heating is that the temperature in between the heat source and the thing being heated does not change. The air temperature in between is not heated. It is a almost magical form of radiation where heat energy, because remember heat is energy, heat does not necessarily depend on being absorbed by a substance in order for it to move. It will literally pass through space without affecting anything in between. That's pretty neat. That'll, that'll blow your mind if you think about it too hard. But radiation does not take place in a conventional air conditioning system where we're moving heat from one airstream and depositing it into another airstream. This is important to remember when we're thinking about air conditioners in the sun. Um, being in the sun is not a very important factor when it comes to air conditioning systems. We set air conditioning systems on flat roofs that are in the sun every day, all day long. And when we're thinking about the performance of that air conditioner, the fact that it's in the sun isn't really a thing. Commercial air conditioners, almost all of them, they're in the sun all the time. Commercial refrigeration systems, it's, it's, the, way, it's the way they are. And it really does not impact their operation. So that's something to remember, uh, especially when somebody says, well, uh, of course that thing doesn't work. It's in the sun. If we put it on the safety side of the house, it'll work better. Well, what if there is no shady side? What are you going to do then? It's really not a factor. It doesn't have a big impact. Let's go back to this idea that heat energy is not the same as temperature. BTU, heat energy, is not the same thing as degrees Fahrenheit temperature. And let's examine this a little more in detail. One gallon of water weighs 8.33 pounds. Notice I'm sticking with the English form of measurement here, the imperial form of measurement. The specific heat of water is one. Well, how do I know that? I can know, I know I can weigh a gallon of water. What the heck is this specific heat stuff? Specific heat goes back to the definition of a BTU. 
Specific heat means, and you might want to write this down, specific heat means the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of a substance, one degree Fahrenheit. We already discussed that a BTU is the unit of measurement, the amount of heat required to raise one pound of water, one degree Fahrenheit. If, if it wasn't water, it was something else, say it was air, air also has a specific heat. The specific heat of dry air, or what we would consider standard air, is I think it's about 0 0.017. doesn't take a whole lot of heat energy to raise the temperature of air. One is the specific heat of water. If I have 10 gallons of water, that would be 83.3 pounds of water, and that water is sitting at 70 degrees, and I add 1,000 BTU of heat to this water. So every single BTU of heat I, I raise will raise one pound of water one degree. 1,000 BTU will raise 83.3 pounds of water how many degrees? Final temperature is 82. It'll raise it 12 degrees. And here is how that math works. I'll take the number of BTU that I want to add to the water, or I'm going to add to the water, divided by the weight of water, and the answer is 12. 10 gallons of water will raise in temperature 12 degrees with the addition of 1,000 BTU. So now let me take 20 gallons of water. The same substance, there's just twice as much of it. That 20 gallons of water now is going to weigh twice as much. It's going to weigh 166.6 .6 pounds. And that water is also at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm going to add the same 1,000 BTU to this water that I added to the other tank of water. The final temperature of this water is only going to be 76 degrees. This is how the math works. 1,000 BTU divided into 166.6 .6 pounds of water at a specific heat of 1 equals 6. 20 gallons of water will only raise in temperature 6 degrees. Now, it would be an easy mistake to make to assume that the 20-gallon tank has less heat energy absorbed into it than the 10-gallon tank did because it's at a lower temperature. But that would be false. We just went through the experiment in our minds and we added the exact same amount of heat energy to each tank of water. They both have the, added the same amount of heat, yet one only raised half as many degrees as the other one did. BTU and temperature aren't the same thing. Just because something necessarily has a higher or lower temperature, you can't necessarily use only its temperature to judge its BTU content. You also have to take into account how much of that substance you're looking at. That is crucial. So crucial that it is largely overlooked by a lot of otherwise very capable service technicians. Assuming that just because an air conditioner is putting out very, very cold air, that must mean that it is removing a very large amount of heat. That's actually false. It's also false to assume that just because an air conditioner is putting out a temperature of air that doesn't necessarily seem all that cold means it's not moving very much heat. That's not necessarily true either. So this is the reason why it's important to recognize that BTU and temperature aren't the same thing. And um, just like wanting to know where everything comes from, this is another thing that I repeat over and over again, that BTU and temperature aren't the same thing. And I'm going to use every opportunity I have from now on for the next uh, six lessons or five more lessons to illustrate that to you guys. That being said, since we can't measure heat energy directly, the only thing we can measure is temperature. That means we have to do an awful lot of measuring of temperature. As an air conditioning technician, you need to be able to measure temperature quickly, accurately, and several different ways. You're going to want to measure air temperature in several different locations. You're going to want to measure air temperature indoors and outdoors. You're going to want to measure the temperature of fluids inside of pipes and um, multiple locations at the same time. So I encourage you all to invest in high-quality temperature measurement instruments. My favorite type of thermometer instrument is a digital thermometer. I've got one very similar to this one right here. I used to have one like this for a long time before I lost it. But these types of digital thermometers have a huge advantage in that we can calibrate them to make them laser accurate. And they can measure multiple temperatures at the same time and even display the difference between two temperatures. 
here's a here's a here's a thing that you really want to think about that you really want to take to heart simply knowing the temperature of something really isn't all that useful if i if someone comes along and tells me that they have say a a supply air temperature of 50 degrees fahrenheit and they ask me if that's a good temperature i have to say well i don't know i can't know until i know what the return air temperature is I don't really necessarily care what the exact temperature of something is most of the time when I'm doing air conditioning work. What I really care about is the temperature of one thing in relationship to the temperature of another thing. So in order to determine that, I need to measure temperatures in two places at once. For example, I would need to measure the return air temperature or the air entering temperature and the air leaving temperature at the same time so that I can know what the temperature difference was between the two. That's the number that I'm really concerned with. Now, I could use a single thermometer like this one down here to do that, right? I could measure one temperature first, write it down, measure a number temperature second, write it down. I could do that. It's easier, though, to measure them both at the same time. It's also helpful to be able to see if one is changing faster than the other. If I use one instrument to do that, to do two measurements, I, I just don't have that ability. Not only that, you want to have multiple ways to measure temperature. At any given time, I'm going to have available to me at least six or seven different thermometers or different temperature measuring devices that I can grab and use at any time. This is really helpful too if any of my uh, if any of my other instruments get lost, broken, or damaged. I've got a backup. You've got to be able to measure temperature. When I uh, when I talk to some technicians, I'm sometimes amazed by how reluctant some people are to actually take an actual temperature measurement. They'll say, I'll say, what was the outside air temperature? They say, yeah, it was about 95. Well, how do you know it was 95? I don't know. It just kind of felt like 95. No, I want to know what you measured and specifically where you measured it. So digital thermometers are um, a crucial key to any professional air conditioning uh, technician's toolkit. And this little inset picture down here on the bottom, this is a pipe clamp thermometer. It has a sensing element right below this, uh, right underneath the CE label, right inside of here. You see this little groove here? That's meant to, uh, you know, kind of squeeze the unit onto a pipe. You'll push this little button down, and it'll open up the jaw so you can squeeze it onto a pipe. Uh, this happens to be one of the most expensive pipe measuring thermocouples you can get. It's manufactured by Fluke. They make excellent quality products, but you do pay probably two to three times for them once you pay for somebody else's. You know, I'm not telling you you have to buy a Fluke. I'm just saying that's probably the best pipe clamp thermometer you're going to get. If One of the things we need to know is what is the temperature of the refrigerant inside of a copper tube at various times, and we need to know it very accurately and very quickly. So to do that, we're going to use a pipe clamp thermometer, and that's going to give us the closest approximation to whatever's going on inside of that pipe. So invest in good quality temperature instruments. Um, take good care of them and have more than one. Now, I do a, a lot of live classes in, this, uh, in my local area, and I have people bring their own instruments to class. And a lot of them will bring a digital multimeter that has a temperature function built into it and say, here's my thermometer. And I want to encourage you all and uh, gently encourage you to say, that's great. I'm glad you have a thermometer, but that shouldn't be your only thermometer. That should be your backup thermometer, actually. That should be your extra one. That should be the one that you pull out if you need to measure of three or four temperatures at the same time. Use that one as one of the third or fourth ones. Go out and get yourself a good quality dual input digital thermometer, and you will be so glad that you did. Now, this one over here on the left is a good $250, $300, $350, somewhere in that neighborhood. Don't necessarily need that one. This one in the middle is more like uh, I have a version of this that I bought for $70. This one over here on the right is uh, somewhere in between. Um, yeah, and also get yourself a stick thermometer to stick in your pocket as well because you're going to find instances where you need all of these thermometers all at the same time. So don't skimp on thermometers. Uh, by the way, these the meters that use the thermocouple style thermometers, that's what these are called. These are called thermocouples. They have a little, little bead probe on the end. It's just a tiny little probe. Responds to temperature incredibly quickly as long as it is in good contact with the thing that you're measuring, these things wear out pretty quickly. I'll go through a pair of these 
uh, every couple of months probably. So have some spares with you, have some extra ones with you. Let's move on to refrigerants, refrigerants and their properties. We mentioned earlier that in the ice box example, ice was the refrigerant, water was the refrigerant. There's lots of things that can be refrigerants. Really the only qualification for there to be a refrigerant is that it's used in a process of absorbing heat in one place and rejecting heat in another place. So water, for example, is also a refrigerant. Water is often used as a secondary refrigerant in lots of cooling applications. It even has an R number. All of our refrigerants that we're going to use have a number that starts with the letter R. And water's refrigerant number is 718. Water is R718. So if you ever want to Im impress your friends at a party, you say, hey, I'm drinking some refrigerant 718 here. You know, you can drink refrigerant. So what makes a good refrigerant? What, what are the properties that we would look for in a refrigerant? By the way, these properties are going to be all shared by all the refrigerants that we use. One thing, it should be non-toxic, not poisonous. Now, just because it's non-toxic and not poisonous doesn't mean you should breathe this stuff. It's not going to poison you. It's not going to harm you. But what it will do is it will prevent you from breathing in oxygen. If you're breathing in refrigerant vapors instead of breathing in air, you will suffocate and you could die. And unfortunately, some people do die from this, uh, from a practice of trying to get high from inhaling refrigerants. There is no getting high from inhaling refrigerants. They has absolutely zero psychoactive effect, zero effect on the brain, other than it prevents you from breathing air. So if you intentionally inhale refrigerants instead of air, you're just going to suffocate and die. You're not going to get high. Some people get dizzy and it feels good. Well, that's your brain starving for oxygen, and that's all that it is. And it's a temporary effect. If you uh, happen to find yourself in a heavy concentration of refrigerant, the first thing that you need to do is get out of the environment. You get to fresh air and just breathe normally, and you'll be okay. If you are working with someone who is in the process of being coming overcome because they are spent too much time in a high refrigerant concentration, they didn't have enough oxygen, they're going to be at the floor. Refrigerant is generally a little heavier than air, and you need to get them up off the floor and out of the area as quickly as possible, get them to fresh air so that they can begin the process of breathing in oxygen, which is what they need. But it's non-toxic. It'd be nice also if refrigerants were non-flammable so that when we're using torches to put these machines together and take them apart, they don't blow up. Also, a good idea because these are used in buildings, and when buildings catch on fire, we don't want to have bombs all over the place because otherwise that's what they would be if they were flammable, right? So by and large, the refrigerants that we're using today are non-toxic and non-flammable. Now, the non-flammable thing may be changing. Well, it is changing. I wrote this slide like about a year or two ago, and in that time, we now have flammable refrigerants being introduced into our market, but on a very, very low scale. They have not hit the air conditioning market yet. They are right now confined to very, very small self-contained little refrigerators and very small freezers and things like that. They have a minuscule amount of flammable refrigerant in them. Some of our other replacement blends of refrigerant have a very small component, which is flammable, and, but it's like in the 3% of the total makeup is that, is that product. So really nothing to worry about yet, but we need to pay attention and on the horizon. We are probably going to be seeing within the next 10 years uh, air conditioning equipment that we're going to be servicing every day that is full of a 100% flammable refrigerant. I'm, mark my words, it's coming. All refrigerants need to be chemically stable, which means they won't break down or they won't separate from one another or they won't transform into some other chemical over time. They need to be chemically stable. Now, I don't mean not transform states, but not transform into some other thing or break down into its raw components over time. Some types of oil will, will separate. If, you, if you're into automotive and uh, into high-performance automotive engine work, you might have some idea of oils you know, breaking down, but uh, refrigerants can't do that. We also want a refrigerant to be compatible with the materials and the equipment it's going to be used in, right? We wouldn't want something that, say, that corrodes copper, for example. Uh, won't react to or damage the equipment it's going to be used in. 
It also has to do with lubricating oils. Compressors, air conditioning compressors have lubricating oils, and we want to have the oil in the refrigerant be compatible and shake hands and be nice with one another, not react in a, in a, horrible, in a horrible fashion. The biggest feature that a refrigerant has to have is it must have the ability to absorb and reject large amounts of heat energy over and over and over again. And all of these things have to come into the same place at the same time to create a good refrigerant. The refrigerants that we use most commonly in the air conditioning field today are refrigerant 22 and refrigerant 410A. We'll talk more about the politics and the... Um, the usability of Refrigerant 22 in one of our future sessions. But right now today, if you walk into anybody's backyard and look at their air conditioner, uh, there's going to be one of these two refrigerants in that system, R22 and R410A. When we get into some more commercial systems, there are a couple of other choices that are on the market, such as 134A, R407, A, B, or C, and a handful of others that aren't used very often. But by and large, in residential work, light commercial and commercial work, R22 and R410A are our air conditioning refrigerants right now as we speak. So let's take a look at this idea of absorbing heat into a refrigerant, of latent heat transfer, and so on. We're going to do a little bit of a review as well as a progression here of our material. This chart that you see on the screen right now, uh, and by the way, when I look this way, uh, you look that way too. I'm looking at the screen. You go ahead and look at it too. This chart describes the relationship between the absorption of sensible heat and latent heat into refrigerant 718, also known as water. I talk about water a lot in this course because if you can understand what water does, you can understand what refrigerant does. Water is the only refrigerant that you can literally put into a cup and manipulate and observe its behavior under normal conditions. The refrigerants 22 and R410A, you can't do that. It's trapped inside of a vessel. You can't see what it does. You can see what water does. Be aware that the reason I talk about water is because the thing that water does is the exact same thing that refrigerant does inside of our air conditioner. The only difference is the temperatures that are involved and the pressures that are involved. Otherwise, it's exactly the same. You can't drink refrigerant either. So let's uh, ignore this stuff on the side for right now. Let's focus on the chart. And what we've got here is, let's imagine that we have one pound of ice at zero degrees Fahrenheit. And this is going to kind of wrap up all of the things that we've talked about so far into this one neat little chart. One pound of ice at zero degrees Fahrenheit. And my goal, what I want to do now, is I want to add heat energy to this one pound block of ice and observe what happens to the ice's temperature as I add heat energy to it. So I'm going to start adding heat energy. And, and the temperature of that ice, by the way, this axis over here is temperature, and this axis down here is BTU. On your sheet, label that, because I don't believe it's labeled. This is temperature over here, and this is BTU heat energy down here on the bottom. I'm going to raise the temperature of that ice up to 32 degrees Fahrenheit by the addition of heat. How much heat energy was absorbed by the ice during that temperature rise? The answer to that question comes from this right-hand side. This has to do with the specific heat of ice. It takes one half of a BTU to raise one pound of ice one degree Fahrenheit. You might say, wait a minute, I thought water was one. Water is one. Ice isn't water. Ice has a different behavior to it. One half BTU to raise one pound of ice one degree. Therefore, if I raise one pound of ice 32 degrees, that required the addition of 16 BTU of heat energy. So now what's going to happen? I'm going to continue adding heat energy to that ice, but now the ice is going to start to melt. Ice melts and ice freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So while this pound of ice is melting, it's transforming into water, I have a unique situation here. I have solid ice that's in the process of transforming into water. I also have solid ice and liquid water in the same place at the same time 
physically in contact with one another. How much heat energy is going to be required to melt one pound of ice at 32 degrees Fahrenheit into one pound of water at 32 degrees Fahrenheit? That comes from the law called the latent heat of fusion, also known as the latent heat of melting, for water. Every substance has its own latent heat of fusion and latent heat of melting. Water's latent heat of fusion is 144 BTU per pound. If you apply that information back to our one ton of refrigeration, you can mathematically see where that 12,000 BTU comes from. But here we're talking about one pound of ice. So between 32 degree solid ice and 32 degree liquid water, we added 144 BTU. While we did that, as that water was transforming from solid into liquid, its temperature did not change. Now that we have nothing but liquid water, we continue adding heat. Now the temperature is going to rise. It's going to rise from 132 degrees all the way up to 100, I'm sorry, all the way up to 212 degrees. That represents a temperature increase of 180 degrees, right? The difference between 212 and 32 is 180. Because the specific heat of water is 1 BTU per pound, it takes 1 BTU to change 1 pound of water 1 degree, that means that it must take 180 BTU to change 1 pound of water 180 degrees. Now we've increased the temperature of water, and now we're going to continue adding heat, but water can't get any hotter than 212. It's going to start to boil. We're going to continue adding heat to the water as it boils, and as it boils, it's going to remain at 212 degrees. Once again, we have a unique thing going on here. We have liquid water and water vapor, also known as steam, in the same place at the same time. The water that's in the process of boiling. We've got a burner that's continuing to add heat to that water, and the temperature is not changing. Remember, temperature and BTU transfer aren't the same thing. The property of water and its unique properties mean that it has, it requires, excuse me, 970 BTU to completely evaporate one pound of water from liquid into steam. It takes 970 BTU to make that happen. At this point right here, we now have one pound of water vapor or steam at 212 degrees. Now let's imagine that we did not allow this water vapor to dissipate into the atmosphere. Instead, it was being collected inside of its vessel. So now we can continue adding heat to the steam. Now the temperature is going to change. We're going to increase the temperature of the steam above 212. And let's say we're going to heat it all the way up to 250. If you can imagine a line going across right here and intersecting here, we'll come down to here and say, how many BTU did we add? to change the temperature of water from 212, I'm sorry, steam, from 212 up to 250. That depends on the property called latent heat of vaporization. For water, I'm sorry, the specific heat of steam. We just did that one. This depends on the specific heat of steam. And for water, the specific heat of water vapor is 0.35 BTU per pound, which means it requires 0.35 BTU to raise one pound of steam, one degree Fahrenheit. So when we do the math on that, increasing the water uh, temp or the steam temperature by 48 degrees, I'm sorry, is that 38 degrees, times 0.35 BTU per pound, that's only 13.3 BTU. Now if you stop and think about this for a minute, you realize that, wow, from my perception, Increasing the temperature from 212 to 250, that is really hot. That is a very big temperature change. That must be a lot of heat. But look at the chart. It's not a lot of heat. It's really not. It does not take the very significant amount of heat to change the temperature of vapor significantly. Take a look at this. If you wanted to transfer the maximum amount of heat... Would you want to do it by changing the temperature of the substance, or would you want to do it by changing the state of the substance from liquid into vapor or back the other way? You recognize that pound for pound, causing heat to be absorbed during a change of state when the temperature remains stable 
is a significantly more efficient way to move heat than it is either by changing the temperature of a liquid or by changing the temperature of a vapor. Do you all see what I mean there? Please indicate whether you do or do not in the chat box right now. I got a lot of yeses, that's awesome. If this is making your head hurt a little bit, don't worry about it. Come back to it on the recording. And I'm gonna give you an exercise that's gonna help drive it home. Now, this is water. How does this relate to refrigerants? Here's the thing, every refrigerant has a chart exactly like this with one exception, and that is that uh, refrigerants will not have a solid phase. They don't turn into solid, which if they did, that would be a big problem for us, right? Because it would make, make it very hard to move it through a series of pipes and tubes, which is a, so that's why we use them. Um, refrigerants are gonna move the most amount of heat when they're in the process of changing phase. And we use that feature of refrigerants to our benefit. Um, water, by, way, by the way, has the most, the greatest, latent heat and vaporization of any refrigerant. And if we could make water work for us under the temperatures that we want to operate under, we'd use it. But so far, people haven't really figured out how to do that very well. They're trying, but uh, still trying. So we're stuck with the refrigerants that we have. Every refrigerant has a chart like this, and every refrigerant is just a little bit different. So what we're talking about here is a property of refrigerants called phase change. We've got to understand phase change. Phase change is pretty simple. What it means is to change state from a liquid into a vapor or from a vapor into a liquid. If I come back to this chart and if I start to remove heat from this point, I'm going to start dropping the temperature down to the condensing point. If I continue removing heat, I'm going to start to transform that vapor back into liquid water. And at this point, if I continue to remove heat, now I'll change the temperature of that liquid water. Realize that every BTU that got picked up during this process of boiling is going to come right back out of it in the process of condensing. So all 970 BTU per pound of water evaporated to go in has to come out to cause that water vapor to condense. When we're changing phase from a liquid phase into a vapor phase, we call that evaporation. Another way to call that is boiling. In part of our air conditioning system, we are actually evaporating or boiling refrigerant. It's just boiling at a lower temperature. When we're moving from vapor into liquid, we call that condensation or condensing. So in another part of our air conditioner, we're condensing that refrigerant. Anytime a refrigerant has both liquid and vapor in the same place at the same time, we say that that refrigerant is saturated. This happens in three places that you can observe. The first place is inside a refrigerant cylinder. In a refrigerant cylinder, there may be liquid refrigerant on the bottom, vapor refrigerant on the top. There's liquid and vapor in the same place at the same time. We call that a saturated condition. In the evaporator of an air conditioner, we'll talk about what evaporators are in just a minute, we have refrigerant that's in the process of evaporating. There we have refrigerant vapor and liquid in the same place at the same time. That is a saturated condition. And in the refrigerant condenser, we have refrigerant in the process of condensing. There we'll also have liquid refrigerant and vapor in the same place at the same time. That is also a saturated condition. Those are the three places during which we will see saturated refrigerants. This leads us to some of the basic properties of refrigerants that we need to understand. First of all, basic property number one. Every refrigerant will change phase at a certain temperature for a specific pressure. This is called the saturation temperature. This can also be called the boiling point or the condensing point. Remember before when we were looking at the three thermometers and we noticed that water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit? That is the saturation temperature of water when that water is at atmospheric pressure. If we change the pressure of water either up or down, we will also change the saturation temperature up or down. Saturation temperature and 
pressure are linked together like this. They have a relationship, and that is known as the pressure-temperature relationship. And that is expressed by a pressure-temperature chart, or PT chart. And the PT chart is what we have here on the left. This chart describes that for various refrigerants at various saturation temperatures, what their pressures will be, and vice versa. If I know what the pressure of a saturated refrigerant is, I know what its temperature is. If I know what the temperature of a saturated refrigerant is, I know what its pressure is. And those values can be found on this chart. The evaporating, boiling, or condensing point of a refrigerant is dependent upon what its pressure is. And this is a very important fact that we're going to use to our benefit in air conditioning systems. So the PT chart shows what the evaporating or condensing point will be at various pressures. When we use refrigerant gauges to measure pressure, what we really want to know is what is the saturation temperature of the refrigerant in this location. To know that, we have to know what the pressure is. So when we use pressure gauges, I actually don't care what the pressure is. What I really care about is what's the saturation temp. If I could measure saturation temp without measuring pressure, I would. But for right now, it's a little more, it's easier to do it this way, so I measure pressure. So for example, on this chart, we've got several refrigerants. We've got R22, 407C, 410A, 427A, 407A. The pink one and the green one, the ones we're going to use the most. For example, if I have a cylinder of refrigerant that's sitting around at um, R22 and it is in a room of 70 degrees Fahrenheit, what uh, temperature will that, what, what pressure will that refrigerant be? You can come over here to 70 degrees, there it is. Move over to the pressure column for R22 and I can see that that will be 121.4 PSI on a gauge, PSIG. That's what the G stands for, pressure pounds per square inch gauge. If instead of R22, this was a cylinder of 410A, well, 70 degrees, they're sitting right next to each other in the room. I'll come over to the 410A column, and I can see that the pressure in that cylinder is 201.8. If I have a third cylinder that's not labeled, I don't know what's in it. But I do know that it's sitting right next to these other two, and it's at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. If I measure the pressure of that cylinder, I can determine what kind of refrigerant it is. Let's say I put a pressure gauge on it and I find that cylinder is at about 202 pounds. I know that that cylinder is 410A because that's what the pressure temperature chart says it's going to be. I'm going to get more into that in one of our future lessons, but for right now I want you to understand that pressure temperature relationship. Here is that same chart we looked at before, but for refrigerant 22. Refrigerant 22 Instead of having 970 BTU per pound latent heat evaporization, it has 100.6 BTU per pound of latent heat evaporization. So for every pound of refrigerant that gets evaporated, 100 BTU gets absorbed. Since I move BTU per hour, right? Our refrigeration systems move BTU per hour. You can see that larger capacity refrigeration systems, really all they do is they move larger quantities of refrigerant per hour. If I have a very small refrigerant, uh, refrigeration system, it's going to move relatively few pounds per hour of refrigerant. A larger system is going to move more pounds per hour of refrigerant. The ability of a refrigeration system to absorb and reject heat has everything to do with how much refrigerant it moves per hour. That's really what it comes down to. Basic property number two says that when a refrigerant is in the process of changing phase, a tremendous amount of heat is transferred. There is my tremendous heat transfer right there when I'm in the process of changing phase. Another way to think about it is that in order for a refrigerant to change phase, a tremendous amount of heat must be transferred. This does not necessarily mean high temperatures. Lots of heat and high temperatures aren't the same thing. Think about water for a second as a refrigerant. If I take this cup of water right here and I pour it on the sidewalk outside and I go away for a couple of hours, I'm going to come back and I'm going to find that water is all evaporated. Here's a question for you to think about. Did that water boil? 
Most people's answer to that question is no, it did not boil. My answer to that question is absolutely it did. It had to. Boiling and evaporating are the same thing. If this was a pound worth of water and I pour it on the sidewalk outside and the sidewalk outside is 70 degrees, but the water evaporates, did it absorb BTU heat energy? Yes, it did. It had to. It had no choice. How much BTU heat energy did it absorb? Well, that depends. What's the latent heat of vaporization for water per pound? It's 970 BTU. That water did, in fact, boil, but it didn't boil at 212 degrees. It did, in fact, absorb 970 BTU. It absolutely, positively had to. You can take that to the bank. When we're examining our refrigeration systems and we are seeing that refrigerant is in the process of evaporating, it is absorbing heat energy. When we see that it's in the process of condensing, it is rejecting heat energy. This is crucial. This is how it works. Basic property number three says that when a refrigerant is in the process of evaporating or condensing, the temperature remains constant at whatever the saturation temperature is or that pressure. That's why when we see this line of evaporation right here, the temperature line remains stable. This is true whether the refrigerant is at a low pressure or whether it is at a high pressure. The temperature will remain stable. Now, what that temperature is, depends on what is the pressure. How are we doing on questions, folks? Okay, moving on. Let's take this and put this together inside of a refrigeration process. This diagram represents a basic refrigeration system, a basic what we call a vapor compression refrigeration system. Vapor compression refrigeration systems are made out of four major components. And those components are the compressor, represented in the middle, the condenser, represented on the right-hand side, the metering device, represented in the middle, and the evaporator, represented on the left. The direction of refrigerant flow in this diagram is from the center to the right, then down, to the left and up and to the right. So it's moving in a clockwise direction. So as we follow the flow of refrigerant, what we're going to do is observe the various um, states at which that refrigerant is under. Remember that heat energy moves from a warmer place to a cooler place. While the refrigerant is in the process of changing phase, it absorbs a tremendous amount of heat energy. Our goal is to absorb heat energy in one location and deposit it in another location. And so that's what we're going to do here. We're going to start at process number four. Now there are two components that are not labeled here, and those are fans. So you want to assume that there is an indoor fan blowing air across this indoor evaporator, and there is an outdoor fan blowing air across this outdoor condenser. So let's make some notes over here on your page, right underneath where it says evaporator slash ID, that stands for indoor coil, write 78 degree air. We're going to be blowing relatively warm 78 degree air across this coil. Over here on the right hand side where it says condensing slash outdoor coil, let's write 95 degrees Fahrenheit over here. 95 degree air is going to be going across here. Now, this illustrates the major problem that we have, the reason why we want to have cooling in the summer. We want it to be cooler inside than it is outside, but that violates the laws of thermodynamics, doesn't it? Because heat energy moves from a warmer place to a cooler place. So, therefore, heat is going to try to go from outside to inside. So, in order to make this process work, we've literally got to pump the heat out. It's kind of like a boat with a hole in the bottom of it. You're constantly taking a bucket and picking up water and dumping it overboard, taking the water out of the boat and putting it out where you don't care where the water is, overboard. So water heat energy is constantly infiltrating our house or our boat, and our air conditioner is constantly picking it up and moving it back out where it came from. It's kind of like trying to take a, a 
a puppy <laughs> and keep it away from a plate of food. No, you can stay over here and a puppy walks back. Nope, stay over here and the puppy walks back. That's the heat transfer. That's heat movement. So beginning here at condition number four. At condition number four, our refrigerant is a low pressure, low temperature liquid refrigerant. And it enters the evaporator coil at a temperature of about 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Now we said that we have 78 degree air flowing across the surfaces of this coil. Now inside, the re inside of this series of tubes, our refrigerant is moving and the air is flowing across the outside surfaces. So now we have some convection heat transfer going from the warm air into the cold surface of the pipe because heat moves from a warmer area to a cooler area. We're going from 78 degree air, heat's moving into 40 degree metal. Then it moves by process of conduction through the metal into the refrigerant and it becomes absorbed by the refrigerant through the process of convection once again. So multiple forms of heat transfer happening all at one time. As the heat energy is being absorbed by the refrigerant, the refrigerant begins to boil. It's boiling at 40 degrees Fahrenheit because that's what the pressure temperature chart says it's going to do. As it's boiling, it's absorbing heat energy from the airstream. As it's boiling, it's remaining at the same pressure and at the same temperature. It's not experiencing a rise in temperature. When we say heat energy moves from a warmer place to a cooler place, this is the cooler place the heat energy moves to. It's moving from the warm air into the colder refrigerant, and the refrigerant is absorbing that heat energy as it boils. As the refrigerant is flowing and moving through the evaporator, it's boiling and it's becoming more and more vapor and less and less liquid as it progresses through. At some point, it's going to reach nearly the end of that passageway, and it is going to completely evaporate away into vapor refrigerant. At this theoretical point, there's not a drop of liquid refrigerant left. It's now just plain old vapor. Now, if we had liquid refrigerant entering at 40 degrees, now here we have vapor refrigerant at 40 degrees. We're still inside of the chamber of the evaporator coil. We still have 78 degree air moving across that coil. Heat is still going to move from warmer to cooler, but now it's going to cause a temperature increase in the vapor refrigerant. And this is all designed so that when the refrigerant leaves the evaporator coil, it is slightly higher in temperature than it was when it went in. A lot of air conditioning technicians make a big mistake by assuming that that temperature increase is where the BTU were moved. But you all now know differently. The majority of those BTU were being absorbed and moving in this section of the coil when there was no temperature increase. This temperature increase that happens right here does not significantly contribute to the refrigeration effect. Instead, what it does is it utilizes the feature of the pressure temperature chart. When we raise the refrigerant temperature above its boiling point, it cannot possibly have any liquid left in it. It is 100% vapor. And we say that that vapor is superheated. Doesn't mean super hot, it just means a little bit warmer than it was at its boiling point. This is important for the health of the compressor because this refrigerant is now moving on down the line into the compressor. Compressors cannot handle liquid refrigerant. They will be damaged. This is the reason why we want to ensure that there's nothing but vapor refrigerant coming into the compressor. So vapor refrigerant enters the compressor and goes through the process of compression. It is the job of the compressor to increase the pressure of the refrigerant higher, and it does. While it does that, the refrigerant also increases in temperature, but this does not represent a significant addition of BTU heat energy to the refrigerant. This is following one of the gas laws, the combined gas law of Boyle's law and Charles' law, combined to create an increase in temperature along with an increase in pressure. But it's not a significant addition of heat. There is some heat there, but not a lot. The refrigerant then leaves the compressor under high pressure and travels down a short distance down what is known as the hot gas line. And it is hot. We're going to experience temperatures here up in the 160s, 170s range. 
So here's a question for you. If I am sending that refrigerant to an outdoor coil, can I move BTU heat energy from 170 degree refrigerant into 95 degree outdoor air? Well, you know the answer, don't you? Refrigerant moves from a warmer place to a cooler place, so of course, yes, you can. Even though it's a higher temperature, the heat is going to move out of that warm refrigerant into the relatively cooler outdoor airstream. As it does, it is going to drop in temperature from whatever temperature it was when it left the compressor down to the saturation temperature. The saturation temperature depends on the pressure, and that's why the pressure outside is higher. If I have 95 degree outdoor air and I have R410A, that equals a pressure of 296 degrees. But I need to move heat energy, don't I? I need to go from a warmer place to a cooler place. If my outside is my cooler place and it's 95 degrees out there, my saturation temperature of my refrigerant needs to be higher than 95, about 20 degrees higher. So let's put it up at 115 is the saturation point. That's going to mean the pressure needs to be just about 400 pounds, 392.3 PSI. This is why we have a high pressure on the outside of the unit. So now, because my compressor has been involved and increased the pressure of the vapor, and because all of the BTU that were absorbed in the evaporator are now trapped in this vapor refrigerant, when I cause that refrigerant to condense, even though it's a higher temperature, it doesn't matter, these BTU that were absorbed over here are going to start coming out over here. They have to. In order for a refrigerant to condense, it has to reject heat energy. It got the heat energy over here. It's going to reject it over here. So now we start to form a mist, and that mist turns into droplets as it moves through. This, one, this starts condensing at about 115 degrees and gives up its heat energy to that 95-degree outdoor air. As it moves through the tube, it becomes more and more liquid and less and less vapor until finally, at some point, the last little bubble of refrigerant vapor has completely been condensed, and it has rejected the last amount of BTU that were absorbed over here in the uh, evaporator. As we are moving through, now we're still at 115 degree liquid refrigerant. We still have 98 degree air flowing across the coil. This is going to cause the refrigerant temperature to begin to fall. It's going to move closer to 95. We are not going to remove a significant quantity of heat during this portion. The purpose of this activity here is to drop the liquid refrigerant temperature down to the point where when it leaves the coil, there is no vapor bubbles whatsoever. All we're doing here is ensuring that we have pure liquid refrigerant leaving the coil. It's going to scream on down the liquid line and run smack dab into the metering device. And what the metering device does is it is basically a calibrated restriction. It is going to force the refrigerant through a very tiny hole. And as it goes through the very tiny hole, it's going to fall in pressure dramatically. Another thing that's going to happen to the refrigerant as it goes through this little tiny hole and it falls in pressure dramatically, some of that refrigerant is going to evaporate. And this is a weird phenomenon that happens with liquids. Anytime you have a liquid that very suddenly falls in pressure, some of that liquid evaporates, almost as if by magic. Basic laws of refrigerants, basic law number two says that whenever a refrigerant is in the process of evaporating, a tremendous amount of heat transfer takes place. Heat is absorbed into that vapor as it evaporates, but where does that heat come from? It comes from the refrigerant itself. This causes a reduction in the temperature of the refrigerant liquid, along with a drop in pressure. And so suddenly now we go from, say, 100 degree liquid, boom, down to 40 degree liquid, just like that. We go from 395 pounds of head pressure, boom, down to about, oh, what would that be, 120 or so pounds of suction pressure on the other side. The compressor and the metering device work together to create this pressure difference. The compressor pumps it up, the metering device knocks it back down again. And by the process of manipulating the pressures, the refrigeration system is manipulating the saturation temperatures to make them conducive 
We're moving heat. In the evaporator, we're moving heat from the air into the refrigerant. In the condenser, we're moving heat from the refrigerant into the air. And we've got a question. Is 20 degrees the rule of thumb for outdoor temperature difference? The difference between saturation temperature and outdoor air temperature. 20 degrees is a nice ideal. It's kind of a minimum. And uh, what that actual temperature difference will be can depend on several factors, including the design of the system. Higher efficiency air conditioners are going to operate with a smaller temperature difference between saturation temp and outdoor air temp. Less efficient systems are going to operate with a higher temperature difference between saturation temp and outdoor temp. Good question. This right here kind of describes that whole process again. And uh, I encourage you to read that along with looking at the diagram, tracing it through. You need to really memorize this. You need to know at what point what is going on with the refrigerant inside the system. What condition is that refrigerant in? So to review, uh, at condition number one, as, compress as refrigerant leaves the compressor, refrigerant is in the state of a high temperature, high pressure vapor. In condition two, midway through the condensing coil, we have a high pressure, high temperature, saturated refrigerant, because we have liquid and vapor in the same place at the same time, saturated refrigerant that is in the process of condensing, and it's also rejecting heat. You might want it right in there, rejecting heat. When it gets to condition number three is where it leaves the condensing coil, and it becomes a high pressure, high temperature, subcooled liquid. Subcooling merely means that it is lower in temperature than the condensing point. At condition number four, after it passes through the metering device, it is in the form of a low pressure, low temperature liquid refrigerant. We could also call this a saturated refrigerant because technically, as it passes through, a small amount of refrigerant evaporates. So there's a couple of tiny micro bubbles mixed in with this refrigerant right here. But it has not started boiling yet. It is primed and ready to start boiling, though. It is right at the boiling point. As the refrigerant passes through the evaporator and it starts boiling and absorbing heat, it becomes condition number five, which is that of a low pressure low temperature saturated refrigerant in the process of evaporating. And remember, because these are saturated refrigerants at condition number five and condition number two, the properties of the pressure temperature chart do apply to them. So if you know what the pressure of the refrigerant is, you know what temperature it's boiling at. If you know what the pressure of the temp refrigerant is out here, you know what temperature it's condensing at. When the refrigerant leaves the evaporator coil, it becomes condition number six, which is the low pressure, low temperature, and add in right here, superheated vapor. Down here we have a subcooled liquid. Here we have a superheated vapor. Now this can be confusing because you think cool, cold, evaporator cold. Well, it's kind of weird. Subcooling actually happens over here in the hotter part of the system, higher temperature. Superheat happens over here in the lower temperature part of the system. Once again, temperature and BTU aren't the same thing. Do we have any questions on this process and what the refrigerant is doing before we move on? And this will become more clear in one of our future lessons when we talk more specifically about what is a compressor, what does it do, what is an evaporator and a condenser and a metering device, and what do they actually do? We're going to put all this stuff together. But any questions right now about this process? This is a great question. The question is, do other types of compressors basically achieve the same process? And the answer is absolutely yes. All compressors behave the exact same way. All compressors have the exact same goal and the exact same job in the system. And when we get to one of our future lessons, we're going to discuss that in a little more detail. But for right now, let's just say absolutely they do. All compressors will behave exactly the same way. And right now there are three major types of compressors in residential style air conditioners, and they all serve the exact same role, they have the exact same goal. In fact, a manufacturer may design an air conditioner uh, like say last year, they may have decided to use 
one type of compressor in that system. Now this year they may have decided to make a change and change suppliers and use a different type of compressor, but its behavior is going to be unrecognizably different. It's going to be exactly the same. There's going to be no difference in its behavior from one type to another type. So great question there. Love it. We put these components together into units. We have an outdoor unit and we have an indoor unit. So how these things look in the field is our outdoor unit is called the condensing unit. If it's a heat pump, it's just called the outdoor unit because in heat pump mode, it's going to become the evaporator, but we won't worry about that for now. Let's pretend it's just an air conditioner and we're going to call it a condensing unit. Notice we don't call it a condenser. A condenser is part of the outdoor unit or the condensing unit. It has four major parts to it. There is the condenser itself. And the condenser is a coil. It's a series of tubes wrapped back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And this particular coil uses aluminum fins that are attached to the copper tubes to serve as a heat transfer enhancement device. The fins attach to the copper and basically make the copper tube physically larger in surface area when it comes to heat transfer. When we talked about the three different kinds of heat transfer, we said that heat transfer is going to move from the refrigerant into the copper metal by process of convection. It'll move through the copper metal and into the aluminum metal by process of conduction and then from the aluminum fins into the air stream that's passing over it through the process of convection once again. So that's kind of neat that we've got multiple heat transfers happening all in one location. So the condenser is literally wrapped around the entire outside of the outdoor unit. Here on this one, the condenser starts here, it wraps all the way around the exterior, and it ends over here. It's kind of a, this one here is kind of a horseshoe shape, because this one end is, is blank, it's a control cabinet. The other device, of course, is the compressor. The compressor and the condenser coil are usually mounted in the same place. Now that's not always true. Nowadays, it's pretty much always true, but you'll find some weird systems sometimes that may have a remote condensing coil, or they may have a remote compressor. I remember uh, years ago, a manufacturer used to make a, a system where there was a, uh, a box in the basement that all it had in it was the compressor. And so this part here was in the basement of the house or in, indoors, and outside was just the condensing coil and a fan. You'll also see that in some kinds of refrigeration systems. You'll see that in computer room air conditioning systems. You'll see that in ice machines where the compressor will be inside the conditioned space, but the condensing coil will be all by itself in a remote location somewhere else. So compressor and condenser are the main components outside. The third is the condenser fan or the outdoor fan. The fan's job is to pull outside air across the surfaces of the condensing coil. And because the condensing coil is at a warmer temperature than the outside air is, the uh, heat will move from inside the refrigerant of the coil through the metal into the air as it passes across. And most uh, condensing units these days discharge air from uh, the top. They'll draw air from the sides and discharge it out the top. Not all of them have to do that, though. You could have what's called a side draft condenser where the condenser is vertical and the fan is vertical and it discharges out the side. I've even seen some older units where the condenser wrapped around in a horseshoe shape, like literally around the outside, and the fan would literally draw in horizontally and then blow out through all the outside of the coil. There's lots of different ways manufacturers make these now and have done so over the years. But they're all basically the same idea. Here's one in the field, condensing unit with the condensing coil out here, condenser fan on top, and the compressor down buried in the middle. The last thing is the control panel, the control compartment, and that is going to house the electrical parts that are going to be used to operate the compressor and the outdoor fan. 
So this is where our uh, high voltage and low voltage wires come in. Uh, all of the electrical components to operate the outdoor unit are located inside this compartment. And so if your brand spanking new to air conditioners, never seen one before, uh, be careful. If you open that panel, you have high voltage right inside of there. And we'll talk a lot more about that in our future lessons on um, uh, electrical and air conditioning. Notice, too, that we talked before where we have a liquid line and a suction line. These are copper tubes that bring the refrigerant from the inside to the outside and from the outside back to the inside. And this is where they connect to the outdoor unit, and this is where you see them here. Our, out, our suction line, which is coming from the indoor unit, is going to be at a low temperature. Therefore, it needs to be insulated. Otherwise, A, it will sweat, and B, it will pick up heat from the surrounding atmosphere. And that heat from the surrounding atmosphere is now going to need to be rejected in the condensing coil. And that is going to negatively impact the performance of that condensing coil. So suction lines are supposed to be insulated for those two reasons. One, so they don't sweat and cause water damage. Two, so they don't absorb unnecessary heat that's not part of our air conditioning process. The liquid line is much physically smaller, and it is usually uninsulated. I've heard recently that there are some murmurs of codes being developed that are going to try to force the insulation of liquid lines. We'll see whether or not that takes place. I don't know if it has yet. They're talking about it in my area. If any of you are in California, let me know if you've heard about this, because uh, California is often where some of these rules begin or originate. The indoor unit now is going to house our indoor fan, because we have to draw air across that evaporator coil. It's going to house the evaporator coil, it's going to house the metering device, and it's going to house an air filter. Notice I didn't say anything about a furnace. In many cases in many parts of the country, a gas furnace serves as the air movement device for an air conditioning system, but it doesn't have to be that way. Lots of other parts of the country use a completely standalone cabinet that all it has is a fan and a cooling coil in it. Or there may be a fan and a cooling coil, and then this part up here, this little knockout, is there to house an electric heater. So we can have an electric heater in here. So indoor fan, evaporator, metering device. The metering device is located immediately at the entrance of the evaporator coil. And I want you to notice these little little spider arms right here. Two things happen at the exit of the metering device. One, we'd fall in pressure. Two, we split the refrigerant flow up into multiple circuit paths, multiple pathways. So this individual evaporator coil actually has about six different unique passageways, each one of which is its own individual evaporator. So when you're looking at this drawing right here, this shows one single passageway. There are some very old style evaporators that are that way, but by and large, they are more like this one, where instead of there being a single path through the evaporator, there are multiple paths. Each one of them is identical to the other. So that uh, refrigerant evaporation and process, that's happening six times inside of this unit, all simultaneously. Not one after the other, but it's divided up into six sections, they all evaporate, and then they all come back together up at the top here in a manifold to leave as a common uh, suction line. This uh, particular unit is an air handler, or also known as a fan coil. Most air handlers are called draw-through coils, where the air will move in this direction from bottom to up, um, bottom to top. Uh, if it was laying on its side, it, like this one is here, you can see this one is air is moving from right to left. The fan is on the cold air side of the evaporator coil. It's pulling through. Having a fan draw air through an evaporator coil is actually a better setup than having it push air through an evaporator coil. That being said, if you're using a gas furnace as the air movement device, that evaporator coil always has to be on the discharge side of the furnace. It always has to be on the air leaving side. You can never install an evaporator on the air entering side 
of a gas furnace because the cold air coming across the furnace's heat exchanger can cause condensation inside of that heat exchanger, which will lead to serious problems down the road. So um, I, knew a, I knew a tech one time who um, installed a new uh, AC unit, and it was actually uh, a side job, and he had to have it inspected. And um, I warned him against doing side jobs. He says, hey, I put the evaporator coil on the uh, return side because I couldn't fit it on the supply. And I said, you can't do that. He said, yeah, well, uh, it didn't specifically say that in the installation instructions, so the inspector passed it. <laughs> it was kind of a facepalm moment right there. So just be aware, even if it doesn't specifically tell you not to, you can't do it. And uh, unfortunately, that inspector should have known better. Um, so this is the air handler, a few different uh, applications. Now notice this one down here. This is typical. This one has a problem. Remember when I said that suction line needed to be insulated or it would sweat? And this happens to be an attic insulation. Installation. Well, that suction line insulation stops short, and there's, a ser there's about a foot worth of exposed pipe. That's going to sweat, and that's going to drip. And it looks like the safety catch pan that's mounted underneath the whole unit to catch drips uh, is not going to catch the drips that are coming off of part of this pipe. That's a problem. When you're out doing planned maintenance work and you're looking at things installation, this is one of the things you would want to call out and say, hey, we, uh, uh, we want to get some insulation and insulate this short piece of pipe right here so that it doesn't cause water damage down the road. You'd be doing a really big favor uh, from your, uh, for your homeowners, for your customers. Air filter, of course, on the incoming side, air inlet side, and uh, so there we go. Those are typical situations. Now let's take and put all of these components together so that we can kind of understand how our system works. Starting with the indoor side, we've got the evaporator coil, we've got the blower, drawing air in from the return air duct, blowing it up. This is, happens to be a blow-through system with a gas furnace. There's our furnace flue. Through the fins of the evaporator coil. While that's happening, the compressor is running, pushing liquid refrigerant down the liquid line. It hits the metering device, drops in pressure and temperature, and as the warm air blows across the coil, it causes that refrigerant to evaporate and begins absorbing heat from the air. As the refrigerant travels through the evaporator coil, by the time it leaves, it has completely evaporated, absorbing heat as it went, and is now in the form of a low-pressure, low-temperature vapor. As the uh, air passes through the coil, it will fall in temperature because it is having heat absorbed from it. So the air is coming in at a warmer temperature is leaving at a cooler temperature. As that suction gas comes uh, back to the compressor, the compressor elevates its pressure and sends that hot gas, high pressure, high temperature, superheated vapor into the condensing coil. We're now the warm outside air, but it's still cooler than the refrigerant in the coil, passes across the coil, causing that refrigerant to condense. All of the heat that it picked up inside here is now being rejected out here. Now we have another air temperature change. As the air passes across the coil, it comes in at a lower temperature and it leaves at a higher temperature. When we talk about testing air conditioners, we'll talk about what those temperatures need to be and how to measure them. Remember, we talk about measuring temperature, right? As the refrigerant condenses into liquid, it ultimately leaves in the form of a liquid high pressure, high temperature liquid refrigerant entering the metering device to begin the cycle again. It's important to realize this whole cycle is continuous. The refrigerant is continuously moving and continuously flowing through these tubes, and um, the air is continuously moving as well. It's a, it's a really neat, dynamic, moving, constantly changing system. And when we check them, we have to be able to observe it in real time and watch things as they change, because they will which is really neat. It's, it's a really cool thing, and we're going to get into how to do that more as we move forward and how to use the instruments and how to use the tools. So I want to pause for a second and see if there are any questions. I see I've got one here, but I'll address that later. Any questions about this air conditioning process before I give you your homework? 
The question is, why is it more efficient to have the air drawn across the coil instead of pushed against it? And uh, when the air is in a moving in a draw-through system, the way that it moves through the coil and across the fins is more uniform. When we are pushing the air, it's moving at a much higher velocity and it's a lot more turbulent. So we can literally be, let me back up to that page right there. We have the effect of when we're pushing up through the coil, uh, some parts of the coil will flow more air than others. And um, that kind of can disrupt things. It's not super noticeable. If, for example, if you were to go onto this upflow system right here and you say, oh, man, this thing is running very poorly because it's an upflow system, no, you're actually never going to see that. But whenever possible, manufacturers like to design their systems in a draw-through because the rate of air movement, say, through this little section of the coil here is going to be the same as it is in the middle of the coil and further down. That's the reason for it. More uniform airflow across the entire surface area of the coil versus on the push through, more turbulent airflow, and, uh, and so on and so forth. That's one of the side benefits, by the way, of the end style coils is that they divide the air up more, and especially those reams that have all kinds of different little coils in them, they divide the air up more to help get some even distribution of air across the major surface area of the coil. And uh, it's not a huge thing. But when you look at commercial units, for example, uh, you're going to find that almost all of them are draw-through coils. And uh, residentially, though, in upflow furnaces, they're all going to be blow-through and like I said, not a huge difference either way, uh, but I just kind of wanted to explain why they are the way they are. That's why they make them that way. Good question. Anybody else? Moving on to your homework. Yes, there is homework. Yes, I want you to do it. There's no excuse. This is the best thing for you to do. Um, if you only do one thing, I tell you, do this one. <laughs> Get yourself a good digital thermometer. Get yourself a big pot of water, the biggest stock pot you've got in your house. The bigger, the better. Fill it full of cold water and set it on the stove and turn the burner on to boil. Doesn't matter if it's electric or gas, don't care. Turn it on to boil. Set up your thermometer so that you are measuring some point in the center of that part of pot of water and sit there and watch it. One way that you can do this real easily is to use a wooden spoon or some other rest laid across the opening of the pot and take your bead probe thermocouple and kind of twist it around the spoon so that it dangles down into the center of the pot. You kind of want, you don't want to measure up against the edge of the pot. You don't want to measure near the surface. You don't want to measure at the bottom. You really want to get a good measure of the actual water temperature. I want you to sit there and just watch it. Watch the water boil. It's like watching paint dry. It's like watching gas, grass grow. I know that this is good training for air conditioning service because a significant part of what a top-level service tech does is just sits quietly and observes the thing running. He's not going to take any action until a significant or a, a, a long enough period of time has been spent in observation. So get used to just watching things, watching things heat up. You learn a ton just by watching it. Don't play on your phone. Don't uh, check your email. Don't play your Facebook games. Just watch the pot, watch the thermometer. And you will experience firsthand what we discussed way back here. You're gonna see this happen in real time. Next week when we come back, I'm going to ask you what temperature your water boiled at. So you better do this because I'm going to put you on the spot. I'm just kidding. I'm going to ask you. Um, watch the sensible temperature rise until the water reaches the boiling point. Observe the water temperature as the water boils. Watch what happens to that thermometer. Turn your burner a little bit lower. Set it down to just a simmer, just barely a bubble. Watch what happens to your thermometer. Turn it up midway. Watch it kind of get a little bit of a little bit of a boil going. Crank it all the way up. Watch what happens and write it down 
take some notes, watch what happens to that thermometer every time you make a change in the input. And we're going to talk about it right away when we come back next week. Does anyone have any questions about your homework assignment? So now I know that what we talked about here was a lot of information, and it's a lot to absorb. And at this point, your head might be spinning a little bit, and that's okay. That's okay. We're going to reinforce this as we move forward. But don't let this be the last time you hear this information. Please get the replay. Uh, please get the recording. Replay this multiple times. Um, maybe uh, do it while you're uh, drinking your coffee in the morning before you go to work. Get yourself up out of bed 15 minutes early. Do 15 minutes a day just to review. I cannot stress enough that this information is some of the most important information that every AC tech needs to know. If you are brand new in the business, well, this is just how they work. you got to know this. If you have been doing this for 25 or 35 years, you need to stop and look and say to yourself, do I really appreciate how these concepts come together while I'm working on an air conditioner every single day? And I guarantee you, you're going to find the answer is if you're honest with yourself, you could appreciate them even more. And I feel that way too. I am so deep into this stuff. I'm a total AC refrigeration nerd. But I appreciate this deeper and deeper every time I go through these lessons and every time I check on an operating unit. And it absolutely will benefit you in the field to really understand this. So please do your homework. Uh, please um, please uh, do your replays. Have an awesome um, uh, break in between lessons, and I'll see you again here next time for AC Masterclass Session 2. Uh, this is Eric Scheidel, the HVAC Service Mentor, and I look forward to seeing you in our next class session. Thank you all very much, and we'll see you later.